Dr. Diggleman is an expert on the history of medieval and early modern Europe, including the Anglo Norman period in which Magna Carta emerged. Please join me in welcoming Lindsay. Thanks, Steve. Good evening, everybody. I feel that I'm standing here in front of you tonight slightly under false pretenses in the sense that the topic of the evening is the law and the New Zealand Constitution, not a theme on which I claim to be an expert. Fortunately, I am reliably informed that there could be one or two members of tonight's panel who know a bit more about the law than I do. Uh, so I hope that we'll be okay with all that. Now, I do know something, however, about the political circumstances of the 12th and 13th centuries from which the original Magna Carta arose, and that's what I want to talk to you about this evening. Because it seems to me, as you can see from my slide, that Magna Carta, the phrase, means two things. It refers to the original document agreed to by King John in 1215, but very quickly rejected, and in fact, a complete failure in its own day. But it's also come to stand as a sort of shorthand phrase for a whole set of values, including the rule of law, which was certainly in the original document, but others as well, such as representative democracy, civil liberties, a lot of which actually arises much later from the conflict between Parliament and the Stuart King, Charles I, in the 17th century. Now, a lot of what we're going to hear this week is going to refer to definition B, in other words, what Magna Carta has come to stand for. So I'm going to talk to you about definition A, the medieval original. A very, very quick bit of context for you. Since 1066, England had been joined to the continent. England and Normandy had been joined together politically. And then under John's father, Henry II, in the second half of the 12th century, all of this area in Western France had been added to the rule of the English monarchs, Anjou, Aquitaine, the so-called Angevin Empire of the 12th century. John's brother, Richard the Lionheart, just about managed to keep the whole lot together. But when John came to the throne in 1199, within five years, by 1204, he'd managed to lose almost all of those continental possessions to the resurgent French monarchy under Philip II. John spent the rest of his reign trying to get it all back again, a task at which he failed dismally. And it's from this that Magna Carta arises. War in the 13th century, as today, was a very expensive business. And John could ask his barons, the senior magnates of the realm, the great landowners and landholders, to fight for him, as they were obliged to do, do in feudal England. But he could also charge them a lot of money so that he could pay for mercenary armies to fight his wars for him. And by 1215, many of the barons were getting exceedingly grumpy that John was charging them so much for the traditional royal rights. And so in many ways, I think we can see the original Magna Carta as a form of grievance, a list of grievances from the social elites in medieval England. It was, in fact, an argument between one rich, powerful guy, the king, and a bunch of other rich, powerful guys, the barons, over money. It's also, I think, a very backward-looking document, which is an interesting perspective, because we think of Magna Carta as a starting point for something, and that's what we're going to be hearing all about. But it also looks back, because the barons were concerned to go back to the good old days, when their forefathers, earlier barons, had only been charged a fair and reasonable amount for royal rights by John's ancestors. Now he was charging them far too much. The value of these traditional feudal rights was being inflated. So that's the background. What does the document actually say? Well, I can tell you what it does not say. It's very dull, it's very technical, it's very boring. It is not, we hold these truths to be self-evident, uh, all men were created equal. It's not a grand statement like that, although Jefferson and the framers of the Declaration of Independence were certainly influenced heavily by Magna Carta. What it does do is try and set fair and reasonable rates for some of these feudal and family transactions that the barons were concerned about. The first dozen or so clauses are all about this. The 63 clauses into which it's traditionally divided. If we look at the first dozen or so, they deal with, just to give you one example, the fact that if a baron dies and he wants to pass on his land to his heir, there's a certain amount of money he has to pay to the king for that right. Now, that's okay. Nobody's complaining about that, because that had always been the case. It's the amount 
that they're worried about, it's the amount that, that they're annoyed about. And so they want to set the record straight by going back to the way things used to be done. Other sorts of family issues that come up at the start of Magna Carta, you can see on the slide that there. If an heir is underage, who's going to look after him or her? How are we going to stop that guardian ripping off all the money? What about looking after the economic rights of widows so that the king cannot exploit that situation? So essentially the first part of Magna Carta is all about the barons trying to protect their stuff. It then goes on to talk about the setting of various fines and fees for local offences, a whole range of minor misdemeanors. And a lot of Magna Carta is actually about material that is extremely specific to the circumstances of the early 13th century and is totally meaningless a couple of decades later, let alone uh, in the modern world. So why am I standing here talking to you about it? Well, of course, by the time we get down about halfway through the document, we do get to the famous clauses. Now, I will say that I think the fact that these famous clauses, which have stood the test of time, come about half to two-thirds of the way through means that they probably weren't as important to the barons as the earlier stuff about the family matters, which is what they were really concerned with. But here we go. What do these famous clauses about the rule of law say? No free man shall be arrested or imprisoned or deceased. That means all his property taken away or outlawed, or exiled, or in any way victimised. Neither will we, that's the king, attack him, or send anyone to attack him, except by, and here's the key phrase, the lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. And then in 40, to no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice. There is the statement about the rule of law. Well, that's all very well, but within three months of agreeing to this, John had turned his back on it and reneged on it. He had the support of his ally, Pope Innocent III, in doing so, who gave him moral authority, and the only recourse the barons had was war, and a civil war emerged. Now, later on in 1216, John made what I think was undoubtedly the most decisive and successful move of his entire career when he died. And that's because it took the heat out of the situation. This was not a rebellion against the idea of monarchy as such. This was not Russia in 1917 or France in the aftermath of 1789. This was a specific disagreement with one particular monarch. And when he was off the scene, things eased somewhat. All the same, over the next few decades, under John's son, Henry III, and under his grandson, Edward I, later generations of barons found it useful to recall Magna Carta when they were having their own disagreements with their monarchs. And the document was issued, reissued, on a number of occasions. It was abbreviated and condensed so that the two famous clauses I've got here became combined as Clause 29 in the later versions. And that was entered onto the Statute Books of England in the late 13th century uh, and remains there today and indeed uh, on the law of New Zealand. Uh, Imperial Laws Application Act 1988, I believe, if I, if I might say so. I'm glad I got that one right. Okay, now just to give you one example of how this worked, when Edward I, who you can see here, was addressing the newly emerging institution of Parliament at the end of the 13th century, he needed money too, because he wanted to fight his Scottish wars. He was busy up there in the north fighting against uh, William Wallace and Robert the Bruce and Mel Gibson and other such rascals, and he needed money. So he said to Parliament... Uh, I need money for my wars, I want to raise taxes. They said, yes, as long as you reissue Magna Carta. And that's the pattern that emerged. So it's starting to become important. Now, I'm going to leap forward just to finish uh, a number of centuries with well, one last major point I want to make for you. And that's to take you to 1985, when the members of the American Bar Association gathered at Runnymede, where Magna Carta had or originally been instigated, to pledge their adherence, as you can see, to the principles of the Great Charter. And they have this nice little memorial stone which says all this. And I want to ask, what principles was it that they were adhering to? Well, certainly, they would have thought that they were adhering to the due process of law and the fact that the sovereign power should be restrained by the law. And those things are certainly in Magna Carta. But it's an interesting thing with historical scholarship, that sometimes when we're looking at ancient documents, we find what we want to find, and we ignore all the other stuff. And it would be easy to find another set of principles in Magna Carta too. For example, that it only applies to free men. We read that phrase, no free man shall be arrested, and we think, fabulous, democracy. It's not. In the 13th century, a free man was a technical term. It meant someone who was not unfree. The majority of the population were unfree. They were peasants who worked the land and had no control over their lives. So free men is a very limited term. It also, we could look to Magna Carta for other principles, such as the fact that women's voices were held to have no power in courts of law. Try getting away with that today. <laughs> 
and that the activities of Jewish moneylenders should be restricted. So we could very easily look to Magna Carta as a set of principles that we could label as elitist, sexist, and racist. Now, of course, I'm being slightly provocative in saying that, but my point is that that would be unfair because principles such as uh, gender equality or racial equality simply did not exist in the cultural framework of the 13th century, so we shouldn't judge by those standards. But by the same token, neither did concepts such as parliamentary democracy or civil liberties. If you look for those in Magna Carta, you won't find them because they're not there. So what does Magna Carta mean and why are we here talking about it today? Well, it does have something very important to say to us about the rule of law, but it also stands as a starting point and a point of inspiration through later centuries for many other people seeking many other freedoms. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.